don't want to hear God. I want to honor him, I really do, but I don't know where to start. How do I even hear God's voice? Hey everyone, welcome back to our second installment of this sermon series called Failure to Launch, Four Common Obstacles to Living Your Purpose and How to Overcome Them. And this is the time of year when you want to launch. Everything is launching. And you wanna make sure that you are able to maintain your connection with God during this really crazy, scheduled, overscheduled, stressful time. And that's what we talked about. We talked about last week a bit about the first obstacle, which is stress. Stress can derail you from what God wants for you because the more anxious you get about things, the more you just want to do anything to get rid of that stress. And you might decide you want to exchange God's plan for your plan because your plan will move things along faster, you think. That's one of the obstacles to launching into our God-given purpose. And listen, not for nothing, you're stressed for a reason. You have so many things going on in your life, uh, but that is such a big obstacle and we gotta let God remove that obstacle. Not that you'll never be stressed, but to understand how to let that not take a toll on you spiritually. And of course, God offers a different way, a better way. Jeremiah 6, 16 says, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, in all of that though, let's also not forget the rest of our why. There's a lot of talk about that nowadays, about understanding your why uh, when you go to do things. And a lot of it is about your job or about your sense of calling, Understanding your why is important because it keeps you going when you're tempted to forget your why, when you're in the middle of all the weeds, or in the middle of all the details, or you're going through the hard times. To remember why you're doing it in the first place is really important. And so our why definitely is is what we get, that we will find rest for our souls, but it's also about what we've been given. This is a picture of Annapurna, which is in Nepal. It is the 10th highest peak in the world at 26,545 feet. Now back in 2010, three hikers were stranded on this summit. They were stranded at about 22,900 feet. They thought they were as good as dead. The weather had just put them in a situation when they, they were literally stuck and they thought their life was over. And really, it, it should have been, to be perfectly honest, because there is no way you do a rescue on that summit at 22,900 feet. But thankfully, Captain Daniel Oftenblatten, that's a pretty cool name, and a mountain guide named Richard Lenner, they went for this daring helicopter rescue. They had a line, a big line cable coming down from the helicopter where Richard was at the bottom of it, swinging in the wind at 22,900 feet, And he physically took all three of them one by one, and they flew them down to the 9,000 foot where where base camp was at 9,000 feet. It was the most daring rescue. I, I could not even imagine. Think about if that was you, you would honor those two guys for the rest of your life. You would find a way to make sure they knew how grateful you were that they gave you a chance to live. When there was no way out, when they were absolutely stranded, where they were as good as dead, they came and did the impossible and rescued them. I mean, man, I'd probably be naming my kids after them. I would be doing, just to honor them, I couldn't do enough to honor the fact that they rescued me. You know, this is the same idea that's behind what Paul says in the book of Romans. You know, think about it. If we would honor somebody who rescued us like that, how much more should we be honoring Jesus Christ with the way that we live? Why? Because he rescued us from sin and death. In fact, in Romans 12, verse 1, this is what Paul says. Therefore, as in, therefore, since Jesus did this for you, since Jesus provided rescue for you, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In other words, this is our why. It's not just that we'll find rest for our souls, but we want to be a living sacrifice to God. Why? Because we honor the fact that he rescued us. He did the impossible. When we were stranded in our sin and there was no way to live, he made a way. This is our why. But then usually we get to this next step, and this is the place where we tend to get stuck. Is we say, you know, I want to hear God. I want to honor him. I really do, but I don't know where to start. I don't know how to begin even to listen to God. How do I even hear God's voice? If I need to hear God's voice in order to go forward and to honor him, to be a living sacrifice, I don't even know how to do that. I don't know how to differentiate his voice from the usual self-talk that goes on in my head. I don't know how to, to hear his voice in the middle of my life's noise. This last week, I had an opportunity of a lifetime uh, with my son and I. We got to fly. As many of you know, I'm an Oakland Raiders fan, and I'm taking medication for it. But we we had this chance to fly out to see them play the very last Monday night football game ever in the Oakland Coliseum because, as you may know, they are moving to Las Vegas for next year's football season. So I had never been to Oakland, been a Raiders fan my whole life, had never been. This was a bucket list thing for me. And I took my son, Jason, and we went out there. Now, before going out there, I had heard about uh, Oakland's legendary tailgating scene. And I'm thinking to myself, how do we avail ourselves of that opportunity when we're coming on a plane? You know, it's not like I'm bringing food to do a barbecue. How does that work? So through the miracle of Facebook, I connect on the Raider Nation Facebook page, and I ask a question. Hey, my son and I, we're coming out to the game. How does the tailgating work? Uh, How do you join people and all of that? And this guy named Vinny, this fan named Vinny said, you come hang with our family. We'll take care of you. All right. Sounds good. We exchange cell phone numbers. Sure enough, we get out there, and Vinny is expecting us. Now, when we get into the parking lot, we see a picture like this. This is exactly what we see. We are in lot D, and uh, I get on the phone with him. Okay, where are you? We're in lot B. All right. So how in the world do we find him? Do we just leave it to chance? Did we do it systematically, going through each and every section of the parking lot until we found someone named Vinny, who incidentally, we did not know what he looked like? No. And of course, again, the miracle of technology, we were able to get on the cell phone and he was able to say, oh, no, no, no. this is how you get to lot B and you just got to cross this way. And and then, oh, yeah, we're over by these RVs. And then there's a big other sign, this big Darth Vader dressed like a raider, you know, like all all this other stuff in order to find him. And we did. And so here's a picture of us with Vinny, whose family hosted us. It was so great. Uh, You know, they gave us food. We got to hang out. They even painted my son's face for the game so he was ready to go once the game started. Now, Vinny was awesome, and we found him by knowing exactly how to communicate. Without the communication, we never would have found him. There was no way we ever would have found him. It's not that different. This experience with Vinny and the Raider game is not that different from how we need to communicate with God. The thing is, With us and God, we have to figure out how to communicate or we're never going to hear his voice. Life is just simply too noisy. And here's the thing. We tend to have selective hearing anyway. When things are going good in our lives, we have a tendency to just kind of blow off God. Not not on purpose. Just We just don't have a lot of need to cry out to him because things are going great. And then all of a sudden, you know, and he might, don't worry, he's still speaking to us even during the good times, but... Well, we have selective hearing, and it's in the bad times we cry out to God. Selective hearing, I often imagine myself as a kid when I was at my friend's house swimming, and my mom would come to pick me up. I'd always dive under the water to pretend I didn't hear her or see her when she was calling me. Selective hearing. And I think, and obviously, it didn't fool her. It just made her mad. Thankfully, I think God's a lot more gracious. (laughs) But I think it's similar in that we have selective hearing with God. So how do we... How do we turn that the other way? How do we focus our hearing? How do we communicate in such a way that we can hear from God, follow where he leads, and be that living sacrifice 
that we want to be, not just to get rest for our souls, which is wonderful, but also to honor him and what he's done for us. Well, Paul, thankfully, in this next verse, tells us exactly how to do it. If you've ever wanted to know, how do you know God's will for your life? How do you know the purpose you've been called to? How do you hear God's voice? He actually says it in one verse, so get your highlighters out. He says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. What's that mean? It just means, as the world does, don't just do what the world is doing. What's the world? It's kind of society or human culture apart from God. Don't just do what they, what they do wholesale. Don't just take on everything they believe and say and do. You can't just conform to that pattern. You are cut from a different pattern now. Because you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are no longer a part of this pattern, so don't conform to it. He continues, he says, but be transformed. Be transformed. And transformation is usually not something that we can do on our own. I think it, it's someone from the outside is transforming us. And we're reminded that we need to be transformed if we're not going to conform. And I love it that the whole idea of transformation, it's not a one and done. The transformation is happening all the time, that we need to continually be transformed so that we don't conform to the pattern of this world. And then he continues. How does it happen? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I love that, by the renewing of your mind. It's kind of like we need a constant calibration to God. We need to constantly be in communication because we just get so lost so easily. We get so distracted so easily. We listen to so many other voices instead of God's voice, and it happens so easily. Unless, I mean, you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind or else you will even accidentally conform to the pattern of this world. Now, once you do this, once you do this, look at the promise attached to it. Then, he says, you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you've ever wondered, how do I know God's will? This is exactly how you do it. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. So this whole idea about being a living sacrifice might still feel like, I don't know if I can really get my head around that. What, is that, what does that really look like to be a transformed by the renewing of my mind, to not be conformed to the pattern of this world, to know then what God's will is? Well, I, I want to give you an example. Let's say that you are a real estate agent. And you're trying to live out your purpose. You're trying to live out your calling and your faith. And you're trying to do it in a way where you're listening to God's voice in a real dialed in kind of way. A friend of mine's a real estate agent. We were just talking about this last night. But let's say the pattern of this world, if you were to conform to it, it would look something like, hey, this next sale is all about me. I'm number one when it comes to my business. In other words, I'm going to charge the highest commission I can. I'm going to push my customer to buy the, the biggest house or the most expensive house that they can so that I make more money. And you even see it on these HGTV shows when it drives you crazy when the agent goes and shows them things that are like way out of the customer's price range. And it, even through the TV, you're just like, come on. They told you their limit was 500000 and you showed them 600000 And you know they're going to love that house because it's a more expensive house and they might push to buy that house and so that you make more money. But let's say then as a Christian that, that instead of conforming to that pattern, as you read scripture, as you do things to kind of dial in your listening to God's voice, you read scripture or, or you go to worship and you, or you pray and you, you hear things from God about loving one another, about lifting other people up above yourself, about uh, treating other people even better than you treat yourself by truly loving and caring for others because of God's love and care for you. Well, it changes you. It renews your mind. You, you are transformed by that. And so then instead of conforming to this world, you have a different outlook. You're like, you know what? I still need to make money. I still need to you know, make a living, but I'm going to do so in a way where I treat the customer as number one, not myself. I want to do what's right by them more than anything. And and so then, you know, say this, this business comes to you and, or, you know, a couple comes to you looking, you know, to buy a home and, 
and you do right by them. You show them the right size house for their budget and you have an opportunity, let's say, even to make a higher commission. But you know that that extra 30, 40, 50 bucks a month to that couple is going to be significant and you don't want, you want to be in that house forever. You don't want to put them in a financial pinch because you want to make a little more commission. Now, I don't mean to say that making a higher commission is a bad thing or not listening to God. That's not what I'm saying at all. So you could all breathe a big sigh of relief there. But what I am saying is that when you're dialed into God's voice, when you're allowing him to transform you, renewing your mind, you become a living sacrifice. You start honoring God by the way you honor other people, by the way you live your life. And what happens is you start living your God-given purpose. That obstacle of hearing God's voice is removed because now you're hearing God's voice and letting it impact the way that you're living. And whenever that happens, you're right where you're supposed to be having an opportunity to bless the people that God has put before you. So I think that's maybe a practical way of looking at this. And here are a couple of other things that I think are important for us as we look to launch into our purpose and not let this obstacle get in the way. And the first thing is this, we must never forget our why. We must never forget who rescued us. When we were so lost and gone and too far gone and should have been left for dead because of our sin, he rescued us. He gave us a way that we didn't deserve. He gave us hope where we had no hope. He changed everything. And so we can't forget in the midst of our life, it's so easy to forget what God's done for us. And to really feel that weight every day. To say, you know what, I'm going to live for him today because of what he's done for me. We can't forget our why. And the next thing is, and I liken this to my experience with Vinny. I had to get to know him through his Facebook profile. I had to have some conversations with him to know who I was looking for when the time was right. Well, I think in a similar way, we have to study God's profile. We have to get to know what God is like. We need to get to know him so that we know his voice when we hear it. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. Well, it's a lot harder when you're never spending any time with the shepherd to know what the shepherd's voice is like. You got to study God's profile. So how do you do that? Well, you dial in. You get rid of the selective hearing and you come up above water and you you dial into some of those spiritual practices, these ancient practices that have been going on for as long as Christians have been following Jesus. And what are these practices? There are things like prayer and scripture study and fasting and solitude and worship and service. These are ways that we make sure that we hear God's voice so we know when that opportunity comes to live out our faith in a powerful way. And the third is this. You can't just roll into the parking lot with no plan. You can't just roll into your daily life with no plan on how you're going to communicate with God. You have to know, hey, I'm going to call in at this time and get coordinates on how to get to you today. I'm going to call in. I'm going to dial in. I'm going to do this. And for many of us, it means setting up a regular routine. We we talked about this a little last week. Setting up a regular routine where you're checking in with God. But you got to predetermine that. It usually doesn't work to just take, I'll just take it as, as life goes. Because what usually goes is our quiet time with God because we get too busy or we forget or, you know, the pressures of everyday life get us. You really need a plan ahead of time if you're going to hope to hear God's voice. But then here's, here's the wonderful thing. Once you do, and this is, this is everything, is once you do, you're going to be right where you're supposed to be. And there's nothing quite like that feeling when you know, hey, listen, I have hopes and dreams. There are places I want to go and things I want to be and do. But I know that because I've been connecting with God that I'm dialed in, I know that I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And I don't know who that next opportunity is going to be to bless. I don't know about that, who, what couple is going to be looking to buy a house. I don't know who that's going to be, but I know I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I often think of Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. This is when, uh, you know, the the first you know, the disciples, uh, Jesus tells them, you stay here. I'm going to ascend into heaven. You stay here. And if you stay here in Jerusalem, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. That was all the instruction they got. They didn't get anything else. It wasn't like, and then there's going to be, let me give you the four-part plan of how your life's going to work out and how you're going to live out your purpose. No, he didn't do that. He just said, just stay here and wait. Don't leave. 
And I imagine that was harder to do than it looks like on paper. You know, when Jesus didn't come back the next day or when they didn't receive the Holy Spirit the next day and then the next day and then the next day. And then, I mean, they had to live, they had to eat, they had to figure out things. These were mostly people who were like fishermen and had a trade that they couldn't go back to yet, wherever their hometown was. How are they going to make it? How are they going to survive? I'm sure they had lots of questions, but they stayed. They listened. And what happened was they were right where they were supposed to be. Just look at what verse 1 says. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now, usually that's a a verse that we might just quickly read past. But what that's saying is they listened. They were all together in one place. They were right where they were supposed to be. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. In other words, they were right where they were supposed to be so that they could receive the blessing of God and then give the blessing of God to others. In other words, they didn't fail to launch. So what about you this week? Are you ready to listen? Have you heard God's voice and you're pretending to go back under the water? so you don't have to get out of your comfort zone? I know, it's hard. But maybe this week, maybe this is the week that you start to study God's profile a little bit more. That you start hearing his voice so that he can break you out of that conforming to the world and transform you, to renew your mind so that you'll know what his will is. Listen, let's let God remove this obstacle so that we can hear him and that we'll get launched into our God-given purpose. Have a great week, everyone.